Hello and welcome to this episode of Pause with Nandini on NRI Affairs. Today I have someone who I've reconnected with after a long time and I'm so excited to have her on my show. Welcome to the show, Megha Singh. We have uh, her talking about a lot of things, but mostly about entrepreneurship and her personal journey. She's a business growth coach and consultant. Mega has over 17 years of work experience across startups, SMEs, MNCs like Shell, Sephora, Meta, Publicis Group, and Honeycombers. Through her company, Being Asia, Mega has worked in a variety of roles, including project management, community management, relationship management, marketing, communications, PR, events, partnership. Gosh, that's a long list, Mega. <laughs> business development, people management, and pitch training. Now that seems exciting. And across industries, including lifestyle, entrepreneurship, development, education, media, energy, impact, and art. That covers it all, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and then she has been building communities since 2015, including for Crib Angels Club, Trejos, and Launchpad. She's a master's degree in mass comm, loves the arts, word, visual, motion, and she's a mom to two boys working on her first book. And she has a big, hairy, audacious goal that we will ask her more about. Welcome to the show, Megha. Thanks so much, Nandini. It was such a pleasure to reconnect with you again. Uh, it was almost like, you know, we've been friends for years and we were chatting like that, like as if, you know, we knew each other for a really long time, though we didn't, you know, <laughs> so it was so uh, great to connect. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity and excited to chat with you. Absolutely. And I think there's something to be said for uh, women in business and women who've, you know, who've gone out there and tried to accomplish something. We're very quick to pick up allies and people we, we kind of resonate with. And then those conversations just flow, which uh, I'm looking forward to today as well. I wanted to start with, um, you know, since you've done a lot of things and clearly your your background shows that you've had experience across many industries and many different uh, kinds of work. I'd love for you to talk about the building blocks that have led to what you do today and things that have kind of enabled your journey and also points of departure from what you've done before to what you're doing now. Well, I'm just so glad you're recording this because later on when I will write my autobiography, I'll clearly refer to this in terms of what I said, uh, because the running joke in my family is that I don't actually remember anything. Like I have very poor long term memory and my br uh, mother and my brother constantly reminding me of things. Uh, but just to answer your question, you know, as you shared um, in my, um, you know, in a little bit of an intro, um, you know, I am, um, I have a master's in mass communication is what you shared. Uh, but like I grew up, I was born in India, I was born in uh, Dhanbad, which is now in Charkhand, was in Bihar at that time. My parents moved to Delhi, and then I pretty much grew in Delhi, except for a short stint of five years in Rajkot in Gujarat. So my father uh, was with Indian Oil Corporation, and he would keep getting transferred. So, um, you know, that's how we moved to Gujarat. Uh, but pretty much much like I would say uh, almost all my growing up years were in Delhi and then I did my information uh, my bachelor's in information technology from Delhi University uh, and uh, pretty soon realized that that wasn't what gave me joy <laughs> and I was just very bored uh, studying that, you know. Um, so I switched gears, uh, went to Simbi to do my master's in mass communication. That was something I, I felt like um, you know, I really came alive there. I actually specialized in audiovisual communication. Um, that's films and television. So, you know, one of my um, dreams at some point is to go back to that world, uh, write, direct, um, you know, but that's what I studied. And, you know, I remember um, we used to have these film analysis classes and, you know, we would watch these old movies and then we would analyze it. And, you know, sitting there, I felt like, I'm finally at a place where I belong, you know? Um, so, and then, but you know, um, life took a t another turn and, um, you know, I, I fell in love and uh, met my husband online. Uh, and then, you know, just 
I mean, uh, to kind of make things work, you know, and again, it's not on him, but I think at that point, I wasn't ready for a life in the in the media like in films and television so i uh, after graduating uh went and worked for a corporate communication agency very you know traditional nine to five you have regular working hours and that meant that you know i i would have time to connect uh with my boyfriend um you know unlike you know films and television where you have like very odd hours you know uh, of shoots and things like that um, so that was, um, I, I was working in Mumbai for four years, uh, and then uh, we got married, and I moved to Singapore in 2011. And I was working, um, you know, with an amazing company, it was called uh, Prism Research and Communication, and we worked on uh, some lovely projects, like we would, we would do annual reports and corporate presentations, um, and with companies like real estate, it, who were like real estate companies, finance companies, oil and gas companies. So I think when I moved to Singapore, I was like, let's do like a, you know, a reboot, you know, uh, like I have this opportunity. I've come here uh, with like, you know, no network, no friends, don't know anyone. And I, I I can have a fresh start, you know, so let's see what I want to do, you know. And so I took up a number of like unpaid internships. Like I was very fascinated by the event space, by PR space. Um, you know, uh, by fashion and beauty and lifestyle, that world, you know, seemed so glamorous. I was like, let's try it out, you know. So I, I did like from 2011 to 2013, I did like a, a whole bunch of internships. Uh, like one, uh, I mean, you have lived in Singapore, so you know Takashimaya, the, um, the, the, you know, the department store. So one of my internships was actually as, as a retail assistant on the floor, you know, from 10 to 10. And I still remember it because it was such a learning experience for me. Like once you do retail, <laughs> you realize like, you know, what people and human nature and life, it's all about, you know. And I have like so much respect now for people who do like, you know, retail floor work or retail work. But like that was just something, um, you know, and, and, and it's just like, you know, what I want to highlight there is that it wouldn't be something that I would think of doing back in India because it would be like, oh, you're like working in a shop. You're like a retail assistant, like kind of looked down upon. But here I was like, hey, I'm free. Like nobody knows me. I'll just do what I want. Um, so, um, you know, that. so I, I did like a whole bunch of things like that. I also like in that period want to highlight that I was working, I volunteered with an NGO called AWARE. Uh, do you know AWARE, Nandini? Um, Not the domestic violence Um sort of resolution agent is it is it the yeah same? yeah 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 they do that so that's part of the work they yeah. do so um they uh, i mean the the full form is association of women for action and research and they were kind of the original um organization that was formed to help women uh, you know get more parity more education more jobs uh, and then, yes, domestic violence, uh, you know, they have a sexual assault helpline as well. So they do a whole bunch of, uh, of work in that area. And I volunteered with them for a year, including as part of the, you know, they would organize fundraising balls. So I was part of the team that did that. And it was such an interesting experience for me because I feel that in in that one year, approximately, I really got to know Singapore from another side. Otherwise, I would have lived in a very expat bubble and, you know, yeah, like I, I don't know what's really going on on the ground, like what the Singaporeans are experiencing or people who are not so well off or don't have the privileges, uh, you know, the underprivileged, like what they are going through. So, I, I mean, that was really informative for me. Um, so those were like, like, I would say those two years were pretty much like playing around time, but I did. Uh, uh, and then 2013, I, I had my first son. So, um, you know, I think those two years were play around, but also kind of gave me insights uh, because I felt like I'm not like in terms of a job, I wasn't getting work that I was truly enjoying, was passionate about, uh, felt had impact as well as not getting the money I wanted, you know, and we've spoken about this, like, you know, money is is very 
uh, you know, an important topic is very powerful. And it's something that was very important to me as well. You know, like I had always been financially, you know, once I started working, being financially independent in, in, in India and to be to come to Singapore and suddenly be dependent on your husband and ask him for expenses. You know, that was just like, no, no, <laughs> no, I don't want that life. Uh, so um, so those were like, you know, I wanted to do, uh, you know, in, work that I enjoyed and, and a lot more work than like a, you know, one job itself. And then um, wanted to make more money. And then I wanted some flexibility um, to be there for my son. So those three factors kind of motivated me to set up my own company in um, 2015. I think, uh, you know, as you're speaking, I can kind of see how the building blocks Hmm. sort of fell into place but I also enjoyed listening to the fact that of course it's 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 sort of a luxury not everybody will have which is two years to play around and find yes. what resonates but hmm. if you do have that I I really picked up on the fact that you were quite open to experiment and yeah. do things that um that perhaps were new to you and yeah. carry on I think it's an interesting sort of journey that and we'll get to what comes after that but I'd love to hear how so you started the company and then what was it that your company was offering at that time right and, and no I just want to clarify of course I've used the word play around but at the same time I was you know actively looking for opportunities for work and you know something uh, worked out, I got an offer, but then for some reason it didn't work out. So there was like, you know, if you go into the specifics, there's a lot of that. But while I was, uh, you know, uh, trying different things or uh, experimenting, I was also actively looking for work that I, I would become financially independent because that that was a key motivator driver for me. Uh, so, but of course, uh, and I think, um, as you said, uh, I, I think my husband was also more understanding because in the second year I became pregnant. So he was like, okay, you know, <laughs> you relax maybe uh, <laughs> you know, while you are actively looking for it. Uh, I mean, while you're looking for it, I mean, you, you know, don't need to push yourself so much. I think the push really came from myself where I was like, I have so much potential. I've studied so much. I've worked, you know, I have so much talent. What am I doing with, with my life? You know, so more than anything external, it was that um, that motivated me. And as I said, like, I, I hate asking other people for money, you know, so that was a big thing as well, you know, because, of course, if, you, if you, you're a single income family, then the uh, person who earns the money will decide where it goes, you know, and then, yeah, that, that led to a few fights. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love the strength of your personality that's shining through. I think it's beautiful. I think it is beautiful because, um, well, that's a whole different conversation. But women being comfortable speaking about money, women being comfortable speaking about their worth in the workplace and mm. sort of owning the fact that they have talent and they have skill mm. and, and they deserve to be paid what uh, they think they, you know, mm. they're bringing to the table. I think that's a whole new conversation. Yes, yes. But you've absolutely. touched on it through your lived experience, and I appreciate that. Um, so then you did start this work, where, and that was not working with entrepreneurs at that time, was it? No. No. Um, so I was in, so, and this is something I actually recommend to all people who start companies now is that please do networking. Like if you want to bring in business, networking is something that you have to do. Um, and um, so that's what I did. I set up my company and I started finding groups where I could meet other entrepreneurs. And I came across CRIB, uh, which stands for uh, Creating Responsible and Innovative Businesses. And it, it's one of the OG uh, networking groups for female entrepreneurs in Singapore. And through that group, right, um, you know, um, I connected with people. I got work opportunities as well. So Crib itself hired me uh, to do some uh, some work. I found other projects through the Crib network. So uh, I started building my business purely by word of mouth. Like, you know, that time, like I didn't have a website or like I wasn't active on socials pushing myself. Like, think about it. This is like 2015, 16, like a 
pre-COVID world, right? Like I feel like in COVID and post-COVID, everybody's very now conscious about having a strong digital presence. Like that time I had nothing. So just got my business through pure word of mouth. And then, you know, it, it's like, uh, I, in fact, I was sharing this story with someone uh, yesterday as well, how I got my Sephora gig. It, it was like there was a Facebook group in somebody who had posted, um, you know, I, we are looking for writers, you know. Uh, and um, at that time, there was no Sephora. There was a company called Luxola, uh, which was like an e-commerce beauty platform. And then, you know, I mean, I had heard about it as, as I had been doing my research in that whole fashion beauty lifestyle space. I applied, gave the test. There was a test interview got in. And then happenstance, Luxola gets bought by Sephora. And then suddenly I'm working for Sephora, you know, and they are still one of my clients. And it's like, so that's what I'm saying. It's, it was like through again, like, you know, we even now Facebook groups are very active and a lot of people find uh, work through it. They find uh, employees, they find hires through it. So, you know, it's, it's all really networking, which is still like, you know, despite all the different modes of, um, you know, uh, marketing, networking, word of mouth, I truly believe is still the most powerful. But really, my initial projects came about like that. Uh, again, through networking, I met a lady who was running um, like an energy um, uh, innovation company, and she got a project with Shell. And through her, I started working with Shell. Uh, they were running a startup accelerator program, which I helped to project manage. So it's like this is how the initial, I would say, pre-COVID phase, I got some really uh, interesting projects, um, you know, where, you know, I felt I was doing meaningful work, I was making impact, I was making good money. Uh, and then, um, you know, I mean, that's how kind of even um, through COVID, um, you know, there were some changes in the projects that I was doing, but, you know, my business kept on, um, you know, growing and, you know, uh, like even like the, it, things changed in terms of like, I also uh, built a website and, you know, started focusing more on like uh, digital marketing, uh, you know, more on social. So like that was the change. Uh, and then um, like, I think, was it, um, I think the big change for my business happened last year. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm just kind of, it's so interesting because, you know, this is what I was sharing yesterday as well. So it's like, I feel like I'm just, you know, the good for me that I can like remember all of that and repeat the things. But like somebody asked me this question, like, what is the biggest challenge your business has faced so far? Right. And for me, it was last year when like I was doing, um, you know, uh, like like I had I had good income coming in, great projects, everything was well, and I work worked on like a monthly retainer system, which meant it was regular income. You know, I wasn't waiting for people to pay before and after. So it was good. Uh, but what happened was that I myself started going through this phase where I was questioning, like, what am I doing? You know, what is the work I'm doing? Um, you know, thinking about my legacy. What do I want to leave behind in the world? You know, what is the impact I want to create? Um, and then I kept feeling that I'm, you know, I work with, uh, you know, in the projects that I was doing, I was working with amazing female founders and leaders and helping them to bring their vision to life. And I was like, but what is my vision for my life? What is my vision for my company? What is my voice? You know, you become so used to helping other people share their voice. And I had kind of lost mine. So I was going through this deep, like dark night of the soul for a few months. And then like I took the decision where I dropped a few big projects, which of course meant like it hit my company's top line. Uh, but it was like a time. So I've really used the last six months to kind of recalibrate and like see what I want to do and like find my voice and, you know, find my vision. And I haven't like I, I won't say I have like nailed it, but like I'm on the road. You're getting there. You're getting yeah, I'm getting there. there. I'm getting there. Yeah. Uh, you know, and starting is is the most important yeah. thing. So pivoting from something that's known to something that's unknown, mm -hmm. and uh, which, you know, which is sort of like even metaphorically from going from monthly retainers to not knowing what's coming. Yes, yes. It's yes. a big shift, but I applaud you for your courage. You know, it takes a lot of courage to take that step mm -hmm. and think, you know what? I need change I need 
I think, and I'm willing to put in the work to go after it. So that's great. Um, let's speak about and I just want to like you know highlight here that this is something that it, like last year was interesting for us because uh, I mean while I took this plunge and at the same time so what I did was while I left these retainers I was I was becoming very passionate about coaching founders so I started that practice where I coach founders one-on-one uh, -on -one, as well as I launched a group coaching program in March and really uh, primarily working with startups and small businesses to help them grow their business so my group coaching program is actually like the road to 100k which is like to help you make the first 100k in your business and then with more mature founders, I work around strategy and marketing and pricing and product strategy. So like I, I started that like where it's like, OK, I'm going to put this out there and let's see who comes uh, kind of a thing. Uh, let's see if there's an audience for it, if there are customers for it. But what I wanted to highlight here is that, you know, it is, of course, courageous. I totally accept that. But it was also a conversation to be had with my husband where, um, you know, he at the same time started an executive MBA. So we kind of both are now in a place where a lot of our savings, a lot of our, um, you know, uh, disposable income it has been invested in ourselves or our business. And we had to actually do the calculation, the discussion, like, will this work? So at the same time, I didn't drop everything. I do still have some corporate projects, which I love. And of course, it really helps with cash flow. Uh, and so that's what I wanted to highlight. You know, it, it was it's it's important to be courageous, but at the same time, be savvy about it. Be smart about like taking hard decisions, you know. And there's so much that just in, in the way you're speaking about your journey that someone listening can pick up on on, you know, being pragmatic yes. as looking at looking at what your reality looks like. Mm -hmm. And then also sort of working towards a future and building and investing in yourself for that future. And, uh, you know, these are all life lessons. And sometimes, you know, when, when we are like in our 40s or 50s, you do think that I wish I had a, a mentor in my 20s or 30s yeah. who would help me with that. And hopefully that's what that's what you're offering to, to entrepreneurs. I mean, you know, there's no age limit to be an entrepreneur. But it's this kind of wisdom, this kind of pragmatism and also lived experience that you're bringing. So that was my next question on what you're offering to entrepreneurs. And you've, you've talked a little bit about that. We'll come back to that in a little bit more detail because I do want to explore specifics around that entrepreneurship support that you do. But I want to round off the conversation about your journey with something else that you spoke of very briefly about the you know, the dark soul of the night and all of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm always very interested in speaking with people who've had a sort of spiritual curiosity in some way and a spiritual uh, exploration. And they're able to integrate that uh, beautifully in their lives, in their work, in all aspects of their being. And uh, you and I have spoken before about some of that. And I'd love for you, if you feel comfortable, to share that. Because I think it's a very real problem and a very real, well, not a problem, but it's a very real aspect of hmm. lives now where there is a spiritual curiosity. Then there is all of our mummy work and wife and entrepreneurship and whatever else is going on. And how you've managed to integrate that. And what is your curiosity? So, you know, I, I love this question because, of course, on most podcasts, you don't get asked questions about your spirituality or your religion. Um, you know, and again, uh, because I'm working, uh, I, I, I can't remember if you shared that in the intro, but I'm working on my book, right? And I keep kind of like doing different things. But I was thinking the the title of my autobiography could be love, money, God, because I feel like they were distinct sections in my life where there was like a chase after love, you know, and then there is a chase after money. And like right now, I wouldn't call it a chase, but it's like reconnecting with God yeah. or like a higher power. And, you know, I, like how I feel my life has been is that I think quite early on, I realized that there is a gap, there is a hole, something is missing. And I try to fill it with like romantic love. 
And then I, I got married to the man I loved. I had, be, you know, two, I have two beautiful boys and still there was something missing. So then I was like, maybe it's achievement, accomplishment, like making lots of money. And then I did make good amount of money to know that, no, that's not filling the gap. And so it's like, it's kind, it, so, so that's where I kind of like then became like more, turned towards God and finding like, what is that missing thing in my life? You know, what am I missing? And honestly, when I began that exploration, it, it felt true that yes, like that gap was that deep connection with God that I was missing. So, you know, and I've shared this with you before, like my parents were were like, you know, they, they were religious, but they were not like overtly religious. They definitely did not force me and my brother to do any kind of practices. I mean, if he wanted to, we could. If he didn't want, we didn't. So, uh, I mean, in a way it was, and at the same time, they were really liberal in the sense that, you know, if we were traveling somewhere, we would visit churches, we would visit dargahs, we would go to gurudwaras, and we were taught to respect all religions and all cultures, you know, and, and so that's like one legacy I'm so grateful and proud of, like that's something I've carried along. And so like when I started that exploration, which was, I would say, if I had to put a timeline, it was roughly maybe 2018, 2017, because I also started doing Kundalini yoga. Uh, and, you know, that Kundalini Yoga derives its traditions from the Sikh, um, you know, it, it's like practices from the Sikh tradition and Tibetan Buddhism. So I had a bit of introduction there. And then on my own, I started exploring the messages that are there in Islam, the messages that there are in Christianity, just like studying self-study, you know, just to understand what are these different religions trying to say. Uh, and, and, you know, this 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 does sound, will sound like a cliche, but ultimately, I did feel that if you, they talk about peace, they talk about love, they talk about kindness, you know, uh, that was my conclusion from the, you know, all the study that I did. But then um, somehow I found my way back to um, Hinduism or the Hindu traditions or Sanatan Dharam, you know, whatever we would like to call it, and just being called again, to these practices, which I actually had not explored deeply, very superficially, you know, just going to temples, buying your head, but not really understanding why do you break a coconut? You know, why do you bow, bow your head? Why are you putting a tikka on your forehead? You know, you're just doing it without realizing the deeper meaning behind it. So, so that now my spiritual journey is like trying to understand those traditions, those rituals, um, you know, and, and, you know, we spoke uh, about the divine feminine, you know, in the Hindu tradition. And, you know, that's something I've been drawn to. So I'm trying to study more, you know, the different goddesses. You have the Das Mahavidyas. So just like learning about it was, I was like, oh my God, like this was there. Like, and it made like, it, like if you just study the different Mahavidyas and what each stands for, it's like you, you're blown away by the complexity, but also the inclusion, right? You know, like all forms of feminine are there. You know, you can be the, the angry form, the loving form, the parent, you know, the, the Lakshmi, the, you know, the, you're, the, you're rich and you have abundance. So it's like, I'm not an expert, so, you know, but I'm still, uh, so now that is my study, you know, and I have a daily practice uh, where I'm doing prayers, I'm doing sadhana, and, and it's just such something that gives me so much strength uh, yes. as I move along in this journey. Beautiful. I love it. And, you know, a lot of my work in yeah. works, um actually celebrating the diversity and the, you know, and the beauty of all of these spiritual traditions that we've been, you know, blessed with. And, uh, and the fact that, you know, you are choosing to explore that while you do all these other fabulous things, I think it's quite, quite inspirational. And again, coming back to the fact that it's really, it's really such a, um, such a private and personal thing as well, where, you know, religion has this whole 
component of being quite externalized, right? right, right, and, right. But then the study that, that you're doing mm -hmm. is is such mm -hmm. a beautiful way to connect with yourself. And that's that's your time. And and I hope, you know, I hope to hear more about how that's going and how it's also impacting um, all the decisions that you do mm -hmm. make and the way you interact with people and you draw upon all of that strength. So that's that's interesting. I did want to talk, like I said, about the work that you do and what you offer. And uh, just thinking about, you know, where you are located in terms of being a woman of color, being part of the diaspora, being fairly privileged in some ways and mm -hmm. having a great education coming from a family that supports you. Intersectionality is something that, you know, we mm -hmm. look at in all aspects, whether it's solving problems like climate change or poverty elevation or healthcare or gender, you know, it's something that's a part of a lot of conversations. So I wanted to speak to you specifically about entrepreneurship in the diaspora. Um, you know, a lot of people have moved out of India with really great qualifications or work experience uh, and for various reasons, whether you're a trailing spouse or whether you're in a field where you're qualifications may not necessarily be immediately recognized such as being doctors and all of that mm -hmm. how do you and now you're coaching different people so you're coming across a cross section of talent and, and ambition mm -hmm. so how do you see specifically entrepreneurship in the diaspora that's one part of my question and the second is specifically for women in the diaspora are there any things that um that stand out to you, both in terms of areas of opportunity or untapped areas, and also some of the pitfalls and some of the issues that are quite specific to, to that um, subset. So if you'd like to take that. So, um, you know, just going back to your first question, right? I think for me, um, you know, I grew up in India. I grew up in Delhi. And, um, and and this is like, you know, my experience there where I did not really feel safe going out alone at night. And you'd always need to be accompanied, uh, you know, in a group, have a male chaperone, have a car and a driver. If you're not, you don't know how to drive. And, um, and, and Mumbai that way was amazing. You know, like Mumbai was much safer, you know, like I, I could take a rickshaw at like, you know, 12, one, and you know, there would be no issues. So I found like Mumbai very liberating, but, uh, at the same time, you know, you had to be cautious and, and yes. there were incidents and things yes. like that. So I think the first thing I appreciated after coming to Singapore as a woman was just the safety and the freedom to be yourself where you're walking on the street and like, you know, you nobody's catcalling you, you know, or, and you, you could be wearing anything and, you know, that still happens in India. Um, but, you know, just and you can take the public transport at 12 at night and it's still very safe. So I, I think the part uh, for me moving to Singapore was also blossoming in a way where I felt like in India, I was kind of curtailing myself a bit and being very mindful of what's safe and what's not safe and how should I interact with people how would this man react and things like that like there was a lot of that thought process that happens for a lot of women in India right you're negotiating your public space right but here just coming it was like suddenly I felt wow like it's so safe and I'm free and, and you know for me entrepreneurship was then about finding financial freedom, you know? So it's like, um, you know, uh, and, and not to say there are a lot of people who are in the, you know, who have come from other countries and have found amazing corporate jobs and are really happy there. But for me, I didn't find that. And I was always looking for something more unique and different. So for me, um, entrepreneurship was the way to financial freedom, to flexibility and just doing work with people I wanted, with clients I wanted to do the work that I wanted. So that for me is, was the, you know, what it meant for me. And, and that's why I am very passionate about helping women 
achieve that financial independence because I feel like no matter where you come from, what's your background, you really need to earn your own money. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it does not mean, you know, suppose you have been amazing at it and you have passive investments and which are making you money every day. That's great. I'm not saying everybody has to go out and find work and all of that, but you do need to have your own income, you know, mm -hmm. It's again, I, I have a very pragmatic frame of mind, you know, uh, I don't expect to be divorced from my husband and I don't expect anything bad to happen. But it's it's very important to have your own savings, your own income, you know, uh, and, and it it affects the power balance in your relationship when you are financially dependent on someone. And that's the truth. I mean, like, you know, when I was financially dependent on my father, of course he took all the decisions, right? And like where I, what I spent on or, or you know, could I go to this college or not that college, you know? And, and whoever you are financially dependent on, you know, you are in a way, you're in a way, this is what I feel, you're losing your power to them, right? So for me, I feel as women, we really need to be financially independent. So. That's how kind of the coaching started. Like I, I, of course, coach men as well, but primarily it is female founders to help them uh, start their business, scale their business so that they can make sufficient money from their, um, you know, uh, from their business itself. And, and, you know, many of the founders I work with, of course, have kids, you know, so they want that flexibility as well because of being a mother is important, right? And yeah. now, even though many companies have great parental policies, policies, there are, there are many who don't, you know, and you feel restricted uh, as a parent working in a corporate job. So for them, this is like a happy balance. And, and just for your second question, right, when it comes to diaspora women, um, you know, say coming maybe as trailing spouses, I find found kind of two sets of women, like broadly categorized. One is those who see the rules and restrictions around a dependent pass and how you can start working as like a block that they can't overcome. And they're like, oh, it's too hard to find work or it's too hard to set up a business. I won't, you know, I'm just, you know, my husband will take care of me or vice versa. Like now there are many um, trailing spouses who are men and are doing the same thing, you know, where the wife is the breadwinner and they're like, you know, this is very hard and anyway, I'll take care of the household and the kids and uh, you make the money. And then there's the second subset, um, which is like, Okay, these are the rules, but in every country there are rules. I'm just going to figure out how to set up my business with these rules. And then they go out and they seek help. And, and that way, Singapore is amazing because like it's so easy to set up a business. The processes are so simple. It's very clear. There is no corruption. There's no bureaucracy. Uh, you need to know, suppose there are certain restrictions depending on your visa. You just need to find the right partner who can help you to figure your way out around it, right? And that's also something that I help people with. So Amazing. that's great. That's the two sets. So the first one, so it's it's more of a mindset issue where the first one is like, this is too hard, too many blocks, I'm not going to do anything about it. And the other is like, okay, you know, in any country I was, even back in India, if you want to set up a business, there are rules, there are regulations, you just have to work with them. And then you set up your business and follow your dream. And I'm sure that's uh, true for Australia as well. So just to just to be clear, are you only taking on entrepreneurs based in Singapore or would you be open to working with entrepreneurs from anywhere in the world? So I'm actually open to working with entrepreneurs anywhere in the world. I actually already uh, have some uh, a small group of clients who are in the region, whether it's KL or Bali, um, Hong Kong, a uh, very small number. Primarily, it's still um, um, Singapore. But because the thing is, it's like when it comes to growing a business, like the strategies, the marketing, um, you know, uh, pricing, product strategy, um, thinking of go-to-market, all of that is very common no matter where you are. Where the difference would be, and this is where I work with amazing partners, is like, okay, how to set up a company, uh, you know, how to file your taxes, what are the compliance requirements, they differ from country to country. And that's why I now have great partners in place who can like, you know, if you are in the US, like right now, my I think my partner does US, um, Australia, and Malaysia. 
And then even now with my network, suppose you're in another region, I can find a partner for you who can help you with all the regulatory work that you need. But after that, how do you find customers? How do you tweak your product, your service? How do you price it? How do you market it? That all is very common, no matter where you are. Lovely. That's beautiful. Um, talk to me a little bit about something that I don't know if it's still a pipe dream or if you're working on it, but you did say you want to have a social enterprise that supports job creation. So, you know, I, I'll tell you, it. this pipe dream has become so easy for me, thanks to my parents, because they set up an NGO. Uh, it's cool. called the Sequoia <laughs> Foundation. I was like, great, I'll just take over from you guys. <laughs> uh, so it was like really um, amazing. But, you know, uh, like I said, I, I'm so grateful for my parents. And these are the things that I have learned from them. So, you know, they've both retired. Uh, my mom was an English teacher, worked with some of the best schools in Delhi. My father retired from IOC. And, you know, they can just take a chill life and just travel the world, which they do. They travel a lot. But at the same time, they also wanted to do, um, you know, give back to the society. And this was, I mean, in a way, it's driven by my mom and my father, you know, of course, supports completely. Um, what, so, Sorry, what's the organization again? I didn't catch the name. It's called Swayam Foundation. Swayam. So. Yeah. So what they've started doing is that they, their first initiative was they set up like a tailoring uh, teaching center where, mm -hmm. um, you know, in a, they are working in uh, Bihar. And, uh, you know, like, of course, we have like family and connections in the villages there because, you know, that's where our family is from. So first they set up a tailoring center where they are teaching uh, women how to, uh, you know, how to yeah. sew. And then the idea is that not only would they like, you know, do it for people in the villages, like find work through that, but my parents hope to bring them projects, like whether it's like sewing bags, like tote bags or something yeah. like that. So uh, that was their first project. Then um, they also support a school in, uh, this is Uttarakhand, you know, so this is a local school. So this is uh, usually through donations, you know, whatever the school yeah. needs. Sure support the school and the, the latest one is that they've started a library in one of the villages again in Bihar uh, and the idea is it, it's a free library so uh, you know my parents uh, provide the books they pay for the salaries of the you know the person who's ma managing the library uh, and um, so and it's so you know, when I see the photos, like, you know, people, they have visited and then people send photos where you have this group, like a mixed group of people, like they're old people reading newspapers and the young people, there are some who are preparing for exams and then like even younger are just reading. And when I just see those photos, I feel like just I think back to the impact that they are creating, like, you um, know, it's like they're investing their own money and, and they're, it's like their motivation is just to give back, you know, uh, and, and just like with and this is what I tell people, right? You know, a lot of us want to create positive change. We can just start small. So they've just started with one small library and one tailoring center. And but it, it builds on and you just have to see that, OK, I. I helped 10 people, 15 people, you know, even that is enough. But of course, they're not stopping. They ca will carry on with the work. And then at some point, I'll just swoop in and take over. <laughs> so out of your to-do list, one is already. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I'm like, thank you, mom and dad. That's done. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And a lot of our listeners and watchers are in India. So if any anyone's inspired to get involved with any of the projects that your lovely parents are doing, um, I'm sure we'll put some contact information if they'd like to maybe donate books to the library or have work for the tailoring center. Why not? This is how, you know, and incredible you so connections are made. And just through, you know, my little Facebook page, there are so many people who've connected to so many other people who've had wants and needs about studying or material or whatever it is. So I believe a lot in the power of that. And like you said, even if you make an impact in one person's life, it's an impact, you know, and, and the more people who, who think of it like that, you know, it just, it just leads to this whole sort of, um, sort of a, um, like, a, not, not like a, something that's forced, but something innate in society, yeah. which, yeah. which is that, yes, you do all the things you do for yourself, 
but you also keep an eye out for how you can make an impact. That's beautiful. Thank right. you so much. I think this has been wonderful. We've spoken about a lot of different things. Uh, but do tell me if someone really wants to get started um, with an idea, it's just a seed in their head, right? Mm -hmm. um, what would you suggest in terms of practical, because you're very pragmatic, yes. what would you suggest in terms of testing out that mm -hmm. seed idea and at what stage should they consider coming to someone like you, which is obviously a paid service? Yes. So what stage? Sometimes I think for entrepreneurs, they may not know when, at what stage they should get the help. Um, so what would you say about that? So, you know, I do offer free discovery calls. So where we can, like, if you are not sure, let's chat and I can tell you what stage you are at in and whether, you know, I should step in at this point or is it something you should just test out for yourself first and see if it has legs. But really, that is the word that if you have an idea, you test it out. And how you test it, basically testing means what? You have to find customers. Now, see, uh, I think one uh, uh, thing that usually confuses people is whether it's a hobby or it's a business, right? Is this something you're just passionate about and you can keep doing no matter whether people pay you or not? Then, you know, that's a hobby and you don't need to turn it into a business. Everything does not have to become a business. And, and you know, because now entrepreneurship is such a buzzword. Everybody is like, oh, it's so cool. I want to start a startup and all of that. At the same time, if you are someone like, no, this is a product or a service for which I want to get paid customers and then I want to grow that customer base then that's a business and you need to test it out like is are people actually interested in this product or service and I would say just start with your immediate network like right now we all are you you know and of course I'm generalizing but I think it's true for most of us we are part of so many whatsapp groups we are part of facebook groups you know we have like friends family you know like from our college and from different workplaces. In these different communities, say that, you know, this is something that you're planning to launch and this would be, um, you know, something priced at this and see what the feedback is, right? You know, uh, and you'll get that feedback from people and, and even start with, I would say, um, do you like, suppose it's a product or a, like a service business, I think it's easier because they're less kind of startup costs. You usually just need like a laptop and, you know, you can get started in a product. You need a physical product. But like, even if it's like you found people that there are like five people who are interested, right? You never know for sure till they actually pay the money because like saying you're interested and then actually making a payment are two different things, right? So what I would suggest is maybe very cheaply produce like an MVP. And now again, you know, if you do the research, like there's so much information out there on YouTube and chat GPT and how you can do a very simple MVP, uh, you know, set up maybe a landing page, see if anybody comes and buys it, you know, so you can set up like a simple landing page with just a picture, a little bit of copy, share the link with people, see if people are buying it. And, and the people who told you they'll buy it, show them the actual product, see if they actually buy it. And that's when you'll know if your idea has legs or not. But my uh, advice to anyone is that whenever you have an idea, test it as cheaply, as quickly as possible. For yes. me, I think the most frustrating thing would be to have an idea for 20 years and not do anything about it, you know? So it's like, you have an idea, just test it out. And yes. no harm in like, you know, if it works or doesn't work, it's, you just have to try it out. You know, as you're talking, I was thinking this world today is uh, so unfairly skewed towards extroverted people. <laughs> <laughs> Where are the business ideas for introverts? <laughs> you know, who who might, you know, who might find it hard to actually approach someone and network and do all these mm -hmm. glorious things that um that our connected world has offered. So maybe that can be something someone like you with the skill set can think of. Businesses for introverts. 
Yes. <laughs> no, and you know, Anandini, I do have an answer for you, right? Then in that case, you, because the world, if, if you have a product or service, you have to market it. You know, mm -hmm. there is so much noise, people won't automatically just find you, you know, like uh, that does not happen. But what you can do is you can find a partner who is the extra word yes. and who can help you. <laughs> do the marketing and networking and spreading the word and you do your and I have I, I advise businesses like that where the there's one founder who's the creative person focuses on the product and just like creating a beautiful product and there's one who's the business development person focuses on finding the customers so yes. that's your solution Nandini <laughs> <laughs> well I think I can be a bit of both <laughs> yeah yeah no no and I didn't mean like you are that but I'm like to the question that's the yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, because I write, I know a lot of other writers who are quite mm -hmm. introverted and who mm -hmm. do struggle with that whole pushing yourself out there and being at every mm -hmm. free fest and talking to, you know, so there is that, that aspect yeah. as well. But mm -hmm. it's interesting. It's all a journey. And I'm so thankful that there are people like you who are empathetic and pragmatic mm -hmm. and worldly who can help a lot of people in in their chosen journeys and at the same time be quite unabashed about your own ambitions and follow you know your dreams and passions and make lots of money and make lots of impact so thank you so much for joining us it's been an absolute pleasure thanks so much Nandini I love this chat had a wonderful time <laughs>